Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Underdog Talk, the world's most underrated podcast on earth. And there's just something about the underdog. But today we have a world-renowned coach, former basketball superstar. I just have to add that in there. Yeah, we did our research, Pat. I mean, the one and only Pat Tor. How are we doing today, sir? Hey, Teddy. I'm I'm great. I recovered from COVID and uh, feeling better and ever. Thank God. So hope you too. Yep, and I'm so glad to hear you're you're feeling better. And obviously, that is such good news. And obviously, you know, we're not just a bodybuilding podcast, Pat. I mean, here at the Underdog Talk, we cover everything. And I have to dive deep into the first subject that I mentioned, and and that was a little bird told me that basketball was your first love. First, what position were you? And second, how the hell did you go from trying to be a basketball player to getting into bodybuilding? Um. Yeah, I started playing basketball when I was like five years old. Um, actually, it was playing basketball and ice hockey because where I live here in uh, Lugano, southern Switzerland, um, there are three main sports. Soccer, obviously, because we live in Europe. Yep. Um, but we're an ice hockey uh, town and, and basketball, too, back in the late 70s. So um, my first love was actually ice hockey. The problem was... I was living about 25 miles away from the ice ring. So, and uh, both of my parents were working and they did not have the time to take me to all the daily practices because by, even back in the day, even you in the youth team, you basically had daily practices. And so I didn't have a means of transportation. And that's why I ended up playing more basketball because that was like, uh, the gym was really close to where I was living. I could go by foot. So uh, I got into basketball and just deeper and deeper until uh, with uh, 13 years old, I was moved to the main ta- main team here in, uh, in Lugano, which was the best team in Switzerland, actually. And with 14, I was playing in the Swiss junior national team until until i stopped playing basketball i played in the national team and with 16 years old i actually played my first professional game because here the a league it's called in switzerland and uh i was still you know your junior until 21 here but uh i guess i was good enough and i played uh in a professional league was since my 16th birthday but then at the time you know basketball became very serious in my life and there was every everybody's opinion that it was a good move for me to go to the United States, you know, play high school basketball there and, and really get a feel of what true basketball is all about. And that's what I did as an exchange student. I, I went to Kansas uh, when I was 16, played high school basketball there. And then I got several um, college offers to play basketball and that's what I did and if you could play on one NBA team which team would it be Pat I have to know back in the day or now back in the day well back in the day it was Chicago Bulls all day because uh, I was yeah it was the early 90s and um, I actually went to the United Center twice to watch Michael Jordan play back in the day that was like the big thing. Um, the Bulls were like, you know, the team and on the rise. Uh, Ninety-two, they just won the first championship, and that's where I was, you know, in the in the height of my basketball career. And that's that's where you wanted to play. But for as far as college, my dream uh, team was the University of Indiana because Bobby Knight was coaching there, the legendary. We just yep. passed. Um, God bless his soul. Um, I, being in Europe, uh, I read a Season on the Brink, which was a book about Indiana Hoosiers. Uh, watched the Hoosier movie, you know. And um, for me, basketball was the, the Indiana Hoosiers, but I did not get an offer to play there, so I could not go to uh, to Indiana. But that's college. I would have want. Indiana Hoosiers, and the NBA to Chicago Bulls, obviously. And obviously, you might be the first professional basketball player slash first professional bodybuilder you know, we've had on the show, maybe in the whole world, Pat. I don't think there's too many <laughs> doing 
that crossover. Now, how did you find the sport of bodybuilding? I mean, how the hell did you go from basketball to bodybuilding? I mean, such polar opposite sports in a way. Well, it's actually very simple and funny too. Um, when I got to college, they uh, they made fun of me and they called me chicken legs because I was very skinny. So I, I'm six feet tall and I was probably around 140 pounds, 145 pounds. So I was very skinny. And even the coaching staff was saying, look, um, you just need to put on a few pounds because even though you're playing point guard or shooting guard most of the time, especially on the defensive end, uh, you get pushed around quite a bit because some of those guards are, you know, stronger, faster. So I didn't, they didn't have to say that twice. And I, I started to uh, join a local gym. I remember really old school gym and uh, started bench pressing, deadlifting, you know, military pressing, just the basic stuff and started to eat more protein, uh, trying to get more food. I used to buy, um, what was it called? It was this uh, meal replacement, Weight Watchers meal replacement, <laughs> just to get extra calories in, you know, and eat a lot of pasta and, well, you know, the basic stuff that you do when you don't know anything about bodybuilding. And uh, I guess I, I cut the bug. You know, I started to see some results, my physique changing, even though I was still playing full-time basketball. And uh, during the summer, especially my first summer, after my first college um, year, I uh, played a little less basketball and um, a little more in the gym. I, when I came back here to Switzerland, I went to a local gym. There were some bodybuilders there, and I had so much fun. You know, it's that just the fact of seeing your physique change and and everything. But uh, you know, still went back to basketball. But it just became something. Then the training in the gym, you know, became something that was part of my life. Then actually, when I really switched was, um, since I didn't get a professional contract in the US, uh, my agent found me a um, A-League professional team in, in Italy, in Varese, which is one of the best professional teams in Italy at the time. And I uh, signed a contract with them. But uh, when the season was about to start, I was not able to play because from Switzerland back in 1993 was not part of Europe, was not part of the Schengen agreements. So basically I had to play as a foreigner, even though I was living only like 80 miles away from where the team actually was. So I had signed as a European player contract, but they did not realize that, you know, I could not apply for, for that because of Switzerland's political situation which changed like two years after i stopped playing so i found myself back with a contract of a professional team here in switzerland but that really really didn't motivate me much you know you go from being a young kid who wants to play in the nba obviously big dreams going to the u.s playing ncaa um, getting a contract in a professional league in italy which is still pretty good and very well paid so basically going back to where you started. So that really hit me hard and, and I kind of lost the love for it. And uh, during that summer, uh, I really, again, pushed the weights in the gym. And uh, actually I started to use a little testosterone. Um, there was this guy in the gym who had these pre-filled big sustenance ampules. <laughs> And uh, I didn't even know what it was, to be honest with you. You know, it's like, let's try this. You know, that's going to help you put on some some muscle before you start the season. And I actually put on something like 35 pounds during three months. So when I went back to the training camp for the professional team here in Switzerland, I was weighing like 228 pounds, something like that. And I could didn't even fit in the shorts and, and, and you know, uniforms they were giving me. And... Uh, at the time, we had a coach, uh, Joe Welton. He was from the University of Connecticut, who came to be a professional coach here in Europe. And he knew me from back in college. When he saw me, he's like, you're nuts. What are you doing? It's like, you know, and uh, I was trying to tell him that I was going to lose all this weight. And <laughs> but it didn't happen. Anyway, I, um, I got out of the contract and um, started bodybuilding full time. So it kind of happened step by step, you know, and uh, 
actually by mistake, uh, I, I guess I put on too much weight to, to play basketball anymore. And then I just lost the love for it. Yeah. And, and Pat, everything happens for a reason. And, you know, no one was calling you chicken legs anymore. I'm sure after that, um, transformation and obviously you know once you fall in love with bodybuilding i mean you fall in love with it it's a sport where it it, it you need to give it your all and once you put your all in it becomes the most rewarding thing so you know how many shows did you do and, and what was your best showing um as an amateur i did lots of shows i did something like 30 wow. I think 30 39 shows uh, total between Swiss championships and international Grand Prix and European championships, world championships. And um, so I, I, I did quite a bit of shows. And then I, I got my pro card at the world championships. And uh, I, I basically immediately did my first pro show, which was the San Marino World Pro one week after the Olympia. So. Ronnie Coleman was there, Jay Cutler was there, Dennis James, Gunter Schlierkampf, uh, Marcus Rule, or was Orwell Burke. I mean, all the top guys from the Olympia showed up there, and that was my first professional show in, in, in San Marino. I did that because it was close to where I was living, like a six-hour drive, and uh, so let's get our feet wet there. I was all motivated, and yeah, I'm going to you know kill it, and I stepped on stage, and I realized I still had a long ways to go to even get close to those guys. And as so many do, I mean, speaking of legends, I mean, Jay and Ronnie in the 2000, 2000 era I mean, was just a different breed. What to you makes Ronnie and Jay so unique and really stand out as some of the best bodybuilders of all time? Um, well, you know, first of all, you have to have the right genetics to, to, to do this sport, um, probably more so than in any other sport. Uh, but then the work ethic, um, you know, Ronnie Coleman, aside from the amazing genetics he had, he just loved being in the gym. He was consistent. He loved lifting those weights. And uh, he was just too passionate about the sport. And uh, those hard trainings and being consistent with what he does just – you know, um, made him who he is. And I, I, I think the same goes with, with Jay. I think Jay was really one of the first ones with the true professional approach to the sport, and not just inside the gym, but also outside, you know, building his image, building his reputation. And uh, uh, again, aside from genetics, is is these guys' work ethic and consistency and truly believing in what they do and what they can achieve in the sport which sets them apart. You know, that sounds sometimes a little easy to say, but that really where, lies, where, where the difference lies is, you know, a lot of those guys have great genetics. Um, where you make the difference is in your work ethic and your consistency and, uh, and just believing in yourself. And we had Chris Aceto on the podcast, and he was telling me that Jay followed everything to a T. I mean, Jay was so strict and so disciplined and so hungry to be to be a champion and obviously you mentioned pat that he was a representative of the sport one of the best representatives of the sport we've seen in a while such a great image and so is ronnie now obviously your last show uh i believe was in 2008 if i'm correct so when did you you know switch from bodybuilding as a um as an athlete to bodybuilding as a coach well that's that's, that's actually pretty funny because um i've always done both Hmm. Even I, I prepped for my first show in 1994. Uh, that was my um, beginner Swiss championships. And um, my training partner, who, who was more experienced than me, he already won the Swiss championships. We were prepping at the same time. He was doing, you know, the regular show and I was doing the, the upcoming, you know, upcomers. And um, just throughout the prep, he would start, I don't know, maybe – and just asking me questions, you know, what what I thought and what I was doing different than him. Because I was always trying to really find a reason behind, you know, the things that I was doing and find out the why of what, what I was doing. And he was really more old school from the 80s where you just, you know, take off a few carbs, uh, do a lot of cardio, eat no salt, uh, you know, two months out of the show. And, and I just didn't see much 
reason behind everything. You know, I, I thought it was a little over overdoing things and I was, you know, trying to make a little more sense. And then he started to come to me and um, ended up basically doing his preparation for the Swiss championships, which he won, he won the overall. And I won the, the upcomers, the, you know, first time on stage show and, and then started other bodybuilders from my hometown started to come to me and then people from northern italy started to come and just word the mouth back then because there was no internet there was no you know uh, social media like today so just word the mouth started helping out other people and and um, winning national shows in switzerland and italy and germany and france and just you know and i was competing at the same time so basically i've always done both at the same time and then uh when i stopped competing as a professional uh obviously i had to find a mean of income and i i opened a gym and then a second one and some uh shops uh, supplement shops and and at the same time i was coaching athletes then it, it, it just got bigger and bigger all the time to where around 2010 um i had to make a decision either I was going to coach full time, you know, with all the clients that I had or, or be in the gym. Social media was coming out at the time, you know, the certain applications like WhatsApp and, and just the means of communication were easier or becoming easier. Before that, we would communicate by phone or email, which, which makes everything a little more difficult. So as everything on social media was evolving, just the way you communicate with everybody, the world or, you know, the, 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 the amount of reach that I used to have just got bigger and bigger, just started from just Europe to go up, you know, overseas. And, and then I had to make the decision. So I sold all my uh, businesses and started doing coaching full time. So I've been doing it for quite some time now. And you've done a pretty good job and I'm playing, you've done a very good job on it. And now let me ask you this. Do you think social media has helped bodybuilding go in the right direction or do you think social media has actually hurt bodybuilding? Um, well, it depends. Um, you know, sometimes I'd like to be a little nostalgic about things. And if you are, if you take that kind of look, uh, then I don't know if it's what you see today on stage is better or, or worse. Um, but on a business side, uh, I think social media really helped bodybuilding because um, it just reaches more, much, m many more people. Because back in the day, if you didn't know about bodybuilding, it was really difficult to get into bodybuilding. You know, you had a few magazines which were circulate. You know, maybe you saw somebody in your local gym. Now with social media, all these personalities, uh, you know, are out there. You have YouTube, you have Instagram, Facebook all these platforms where you can reach many more people. So I think the, the amount of people actually connected to bodybuilding are way more today than, you know, back in the nineties, early two thousands, but has it gotten better? Um, I don't know. I, I don't think it got better. It just got bigger. Uh, you know, it gives access to more people. Even when I started, um, just on a, on the coaching side, I, I didn't know about many coaches. There were maybe, you know, two, three, four coaches that I knew were doing it, uh, you know, as a profession. So it's not something that I was trying to emulate. It's not, I didn't get into coaching because that's the, I wanted to make a living out of it. It's something just that I, I was doing that I had, uh, you know, fun doing that I like doing. I think today, um, aside from the, you know, athletes, people become coaches right away because they see a means of, of making money. Um, I see a lot of coaches not having to really build their reputation. They, they start up right away coaching and, and, and doing certain things with people without having the experience on themselves and, and with other people. So uh, that sometimes hmm. I question a little bit, um, but again, it, the reach of bodybuilding has increased lots, lots more interest. Obviously, business opportunities have been created. So on that aspect, it's surely positive. 
and again, there are, there are positive and negative aspects about, about the industry, but you have, you know, you can't just take the positive. There's always things that obviously don't work like, like in any aspect of life when, when something becomes so big and, uh, uh, and gives access to a lot of people, you know, to make money. So, um, again, there, there's good and there's bad. It's a double-edged sword, ultimately. Exactly. Down to, and obviously, since your first client, you've evolved into one of the elite coaches in the industry, if not one of the best coaches in the industry. If you know, you've had some big names, Ian Valier, to name one, and then last week's guest, the two twelve champ, champ, uh, Mr. Keon Pearson. So, how did you and Keon come to be a team? Um. I, th- I, I was coaching an athlete uh, who was training at the same gym as Keon back in Texas, mm-hmm. a classic competitor who was um, going to the Olympia that I helped from amateur to become a pro and then qualifying to Olympia. And I think they, they saw each other. And uh, uh, a lot of times I, th- I, I think Keon was kind of seeing what I was doing with him, the way I was interacting with him. And, and probably that's what created the interest. And then, um, before the show in uh, 2022, uh, was 20, no, 2021, 20, no, before his, his first show in 2022, he, uh, he actually contacted me. Uh, I think it was because he was seeing what I was doing with, uh, with this other athlete and then everything evolved from there. So you and Keon have really only been together for give or take a year or, or a little more. Um, I think it has been since uh, June 2022, so a year and a half. A year and a half, and yeah. already in that year and a half, as I mentioned, the champ champ, the 212 champion, congratulations to both you and Keon Thank you. on such an impressive win and, and really just a well-fought victory. And I love Keon because Keon's mindset is he's there to win. He was telling me he is there to take Sean Clarita's neck on stage, off stage, he'll give him a big hug. But on stage, he is there to win. And that is what, to me, stands out as a true competitor. Now, you know, how would people describe, how would you describe your coaching? And, and what makes it different than other coaching, uh, if you would mind talking about that, Pat? Well, um, I don't know if I can tell you much about the differences because really, to be honest with you, I, I don't really see what other people are doing. And I, sure. and I don't have, I never had interest in trying to see what other coaches have done. Um, I, I, I'm very proud of the fact that everything that I do today is, is a consequence of my own experience. Uh, obviously, you talk to other people, you, you, know, you, you, confront, you confront yourself, you, um, sometimes even with athletes when you have experienced athletes. But the, the biggest um, factor, I think, is experience. You know, when you have done something for basically 25 years, um, I, I think I've coached well over a thousand athletes to, to go on stage. Um, you just get a feel of things. And um, I, I think uh, maybe one thing that, um, that I do that is, I don't know if somebody else does the same way, is I just don't have a system. I don't have, I've learned that you cannot put some, an athlete in a box and, and, and try to, you know, fill that box with what you is right. And you have to keep them outside that box. You have to be open-minded. Everybody is different. Um, obviously, you have a starting point or you have certain ideas to where you want to start um, a, a prep with being an off-season or pre-contest. But then you have to be really, really open-minded and, and just react to what you are seeing and not trying to make sense, um, you know, what you think should happen and actually what happens many times are not the same thing. So you have to learn to really adapt to everybody in a different way. And, and, and I think that's why I also don't coach as many athletes as, as some other coaches do. You know, I, I have never been able to bring seven, eight, nine athletes at a show and, and really pay attention to everybody's needs because it's so individual that in order to to be on top of your game, you have to, you you just can't do that. Also during a contest season, I always see that I never have more than a certain number of athletes, which I can really, you know, understand what's going on. Um, so I have limited amounts of, of athletes that I coach. 
especially on a professional level where sometimes they have to compete against each other. And I really don't like that. So um, I don't know, maybe that's something I do different is I, I'm not trying to make more money than what I actually can, you know, can handle. Um, I'm not trying to sell something that I'm not going to be able to, to deliver on. So, but on a technical side, I, I, I just can't answer because I, I don't know what other people are doing. And, and, and again, I'm not trying to, to see that because then it would just kind of put things in your mind and you would start to, you know, doubt certain things. I, 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 I learn as I go, but from my own mistakes. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think I love what you said about how you focus on each individual client, giving them the time and giving them the attention that they deserve. We see some coaches who have millions of clients and oftentimes they don't get the attention and the individual attention they deserve. And I think that's so true. If you look at what others do, you sometimes start to copy them. If if I watch another podcast, I sometimes try and emulate what they do. So I don't watch other podcasts just like you don't watch other coach because you want to be yourself and you want to be individual uh, and you want to be doing your thing your own way. So I love, I love that, that mindset pattern. I think that does uh, set you apart to answer your question. Now, I do have to ask what your thoughts were on the 2023, Mr. O. Obviously, I know what your thoughts are on the 212 uh, championship, but what did you think about the Open? Did you think Derek deserved it, or you know, what were your thoughts on all that? Um, look, I was sitting in the front row, so for for prejudging, so I had really good seats, and um, um, basically, I was pretty much aligned with what the judges were seeing and what the end results were. Um, I think it was extremely close between Hadi and uh, and Derek. I just thought that my eyes were drawn more to Derek, especially when he hit those back shots, that rear double bicep was just something that really was exceptional. You know, um, again, Hadi had all good poses, but he didn't have something where it really blew my mind. Maybe his most muscular was is, is exceptional. Is is really grainy, full, dense. But then again, um, you know, overall shape. I just thought Derek had a better flow to his physique, especially in that front double. Hadi was extremely muscular, more muscular than Derek. But my eyes just kept going to Derek for some reason. I just and I would give it a forty nine. 51 uh, you know 51 edge to to Derek I mean if I have to take 100 points I'd give 49 to Hadi and 51 to Derek Hadi would have won um I could see it you know um but if you have and judges have to take a decision that's the thing you know they just they have to at the end of the day they have to fill out a scorecard and I I probably would have done the same thing now as they first came out um my eyes were really drawn uh, to Samson. Um, I just thought his stature, you know, just his width, he's just such a big athlete, you know, taller, wider. Um, So when they first came out, I was really, really thinking maybe he, you know, he could do it. Then as the comparisons went along, especially those back shots, then I could see where, maybe Hadi and Derek could expose him a little bit, just in terms of condition and detail from the back, which he, he didn't have as good as those guys. But then again, you know, um, it, it depends how you want to look at a show. Even if if Samson would have won that show, um, you know, you could find ways to to analyze and to to say the why he could have won. Uh, you could do it with all three athletes. That's how, how close things were. And then basically after those three, um, it's it's kind of a toss up. I thought um, Andrew was, maybe that's the only athlete that was in my eyes a little overrated because his condition was really not where it, it should be. And he was not as good as, you know, he had been. I mean, like in, in the Texas show or, or even Arnold Classic, I thought he was just crisper, uh, sharper. Um, so maybe after, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth, you kind of can switch them around. But, uh, you know, overall, I can, I, I can see, you know, his structure, is, his midsection is so beautiful. And, uh, 
again, he's tall, so that sets you apart a little bit. So I, I, I can understand what the judges are looking at. But basically, I was pretty much in sync with, with what the judge's decision was. And shout out to our good friend Derek Lunsford on winning it, but also shout out to Hadi and Samson and Brandon and Andrew. It's, everyone really brought it. You know, I think Hadi and Derek and Samson and are going to battle for a while, and it's going to be exciting to see that, especially in the open. Now, my final question for you, Pat, are where do you see the sport of bodybuilding going? I know we talked about where how social media has influenced bodybuilding, but you've really seen bodybuilding from a lot of years. Do you see bodybuilding going in the right direction? Well, you know, then I'd have to ask you, what is the right direction? You know, it's, um, we have, a, we all have opinions. We all have things that, you know, we would like to happen. So um, I think it's, it's doing well. Um, let, let's put it that way. Um, I think the pro league, they're really proactive. I, I see them wanting to expand I see so many new countries organizing professional shows, pro qualifiers, which you didn't see in the, in the years past. So it's really becoming a global sport. You know, you, you see uh, in Asia, you see in the, in the um, Arabic, Arabic land, you, you see uh, from Australia to South America, everywhere you see pro qualifying shows, you see professional shows being organized. So, um, I, I see what they're doing here in Europe, you know, especially in Italy. They have like 15 to 20 shows. Uh, they have like six, seven pro qualifiers. So it, it's it's good, you know. It's uh, I think they're really being proactive and they're really trying to move things and and get bodybuilding to uh, out to you know as many people as possible. W when I was trying to become a pro, basically you had the World Championships, European Championships just the overall and the normal classic. So you had three possibilities to, to become a professional, which clearly wasn't enough. Maybe in today's um, scenario, becoming a pro has become a little too easy. Um, I don't know if all the people actually get pro cards are deserving of such a title. Maybe that, um, especially now with so many classes, uh, you know, as, as a man, you can compete in men's physique, you can compete in classic, and then you have the weight classes. Back in the day, you only had one. It's bodybuilding. That was it. And then one chance. So already being more classes um, available and the number, sheer number of pro cards given out, I think it's kind of devaluating um, the worth of a pro card a little bit. That's maybe the only thing that I see today is maybe kind of giving out pro cards only in a certain shows where, you know, all the best guys have to go to. I'm not saying, you know, it has to be three, but maybe 15 shows a year where you have a chance. So, you know, okay, in bodybuilding, I'm going to have 15 new pros. It can be 20, 30. I don't know. I'm just throwing out a number, but basically now you have how many close to a hundred more, you know, pro qualifiers a year where, where you can get your pro card so uh it's it's and then the funny thing is aside from maybe men's physique and classic um it's taken away from bodybuilding you know those new classes um in my opinion have kind of drawn away from becoming really really muscular and 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 being a bodybuilder so i think if, if you have to put everything on a, on a scale the category that has lost the most is probably just open bodybuilding because, you know, people have other opportunities to, to get a pro card and, and, you know, to put their name out there and to make a, a living, which again is good for every individual who is able to do that. But at the same time, um, makes open bodybuilding, um, a little weaker just in terms of, of popularity of, of attractiveness. Um, it's sometimes I feel like it's losing a little bit of, 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 of its shine, uh, because, you know, so many other opportunities are there than, than just bodybuilding. So as a true bodybuilding fan, maybe that's the only thing that I, that I see is, um, awarding bodybuilding pro cards, maybe more than all those men's physique and classic and, and, and so forth, which again, especially the classic, I love, um, it's 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 fantastic that it's there. I love that category. Um, 
I love how they look. But but again, you know, um, our our king is is the open bodybuilding class, and I would try to maybe if I was in the pro league, find a way to preserve it a little more and give it a little more um, emphasis and and, and attention. In, instead of trying to you know please everybody, but at the same time kind of losing his attraction a little bit, just the hardcore fans, you know, stay stay tuned to to the open bodybuilding, which is still the king of it, you know of, of of what we do. I agreed, and as Derek Lunsford was saying on the podcast, the Sandow goes to the open. The Sandow goes to the open. I mean, because the open is the open. I mean, when you think of bodybuilding, you think of the open. I mean, that's what body true bodybuilding is and shout out to all the other classes obviously they brought you know popularity to the sport but i see what you're saying pat now my final question to you is what is your biggest tip for someone who is looking to become a bodybuilder like you once were um it's probably something uh, nobody wants to hear or uh, only a few really have ears to to understand it's it's be patient um in today's social media world, I have the impression, and I'm, I'm telling you this because also of the type of emails and requests that I get is, I want to become professional. You know, that's what I hear. I want to go to the Olympia. I want, you know, when, when I was competing, um, you didn't even think of anything like that. Um, you were doing it because you, you love bodybuilding. You wanted to become a bodybuilder. And you actually didn't look at what shows you were going to win or what titles you were going to win. You were doing it because that's just something in our blood and something we love to do. Um, today, I feel like the result um, and achieving that result as fast as possible has taken over the passion for what you actually do, you know, the love for what you do and, and, and being patient with it. Um, today, again, um, I have clients who... Um, want a pro card with one prep with you know the next show and if they don't achieve that then they're going elsewhere and they're looking for something else um and i see it sometimes even on the professional level where oh i need to be very different to next show i need to you know be in the mix i need to everything is is tied to a result more than actually understanding what you're doing and loving what you're doing it, it has become um, a little more commercial, you know, the feeling that I have sometimes it's, it's, it's really about mark trying to market yourself more than focusing on, you know, the task that you have to do to be a successful bodybuilder and, and loving the process. So to a newcomer, I would say, learn to love what you do. Um, be patient, you know, grow inside and outside, grow, you know, in the gym, become stronger. Be prideful in, in, in your performance in the gym. Be, you know, let's go back to, you know, telling each other how much we bench, uh, how much we deadlift. I don't, I don't hear those things anymore. You know, those things, those were the conversation I was having with the people when I was coming up is, hey, I bench press, you know, 454 reps. I, I did this, I did that. Okay. Now all, all I hear people say is, what are you taking? Uh, you know, what show are you doing? When do you think you're going to be pro? Um, just the focus of, you know, what you're doing has changed a little bit. And uh, I, I know a lot of people still have that. And I, I, I like to see that. But, you know, learn to love what you do. Learn to love to diet. Learn to love to suffer. You know, that feeling that you have, that adrenaline rush that you have when you train on, on you know, 5% body fat and, and you see your body change. The, you know, the nights with only three, four hours of sleep when everything goes well, those things, you know, find pleasure. Sounds maybe a little, you know, quirky, but find pleasure in doing those things. Love, love what you do. Uh, take that challenge. And, and if you do that, if you are patient, if you are consistent, if you learn to train, if you learn to become stronger, if you learn to be consistent with your diet, um, if you focus on those, you know, don't focus on your Instagram account, focus on those things, you know, be, be, be respectful towards the sport that you are doing, uh, love that, then you will have success, then you, the, the, the success will come, all of a sudden you'll be on stage and you'll be winning your shows, uh, you know, be that person, you know, and, and instead of just chasing a pro card or chasing a title or chasing Instagram likes, 
um, trying to be something that you are not too fast. Um, I, I see athletes pretending to be something that they are not, or they have not learned to be, you know, that's dangerous. Um, yeah. Like in any job, there, there's an apprenticeship, there's, there's, you know, you have to go to high school, you have to go to university, you have to do an apprenticeship, you learn your job. And if you want to be a professional bodybuilder, learn your craft, learn, understand what you do, but give yourself the time. Don't rush it. Don't try to, you know, break those um, genetic barriers too fast. Uh, yeah. Even when you approach drugs, give your body time to go through all the, those, those, um, you know, building blocks that you can, and don't try to rush from zero to a hundred in, in a, in months or a year, it's just give yourself time, be patient, be consistent, love what you do, um, and be prideful in the gym. Um, be an athlete, you know, be, write down your bench presses, write down your deadlifts, your squats, do those things, you know, do the, do the dirty work, the, the, the things that I don't see very often anymore. And the success will come. That's probably the biggest, uh, you know, advice I give and uh, I would give to somebody who approaches the sport. Yeah. Trust the process, love the process, make bodybuilding great again, as I just said. Um, now, Pat, thank you so much for taking your time. Now, before we go, the floor is yours. Where can we find those Instagram links? Um, anything you're working on right now, the floor is yours. Anything you want to plug, sir? Uh, you know, my Instagram account is P T U O R, T U O R, um, and there you have my contacts, my email address. You know, for anybody who is interested in in coaching and is is patient and uh, willing to work hard. Um, otherwise, you know, just just follow me on on uh, on Instagram. That's all I do. I don't TikTok. I don't I don't have uh, my website anymore. I don't. I just I just um, I really try to stay a little under the radar and, and let the athletes do the speaking. You know, sometimes I feel like uh, as a, you know, coaches try to be a little more important than what they are, really are. You know, we're only as good as, uh, right. as the work our athletes put in and how gifted genetically they are. So um, sometimes we are a little, you know, uh, I, I, I see some coaches maybe being a little too arrogant, too pretentious, you know, Put uh, athletes first. You know they have to be the, the 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 publicity. They have to do the talking for you. And and um, uh, maybe a little old school, but that's uh, you know that's the way I like it. That's also why I don't do so many podcasts, and uh, I don't feel like I need to put my opinion out there every two minutes. It's uh, you know athletes do the talking, and uh, if you like what you see, then I'm happy and I'm proud of it. And uh, but um, I don't want people to pay attention to what I do because of what I say, but rather, to, you know, the work that I put out there. And the work you are putting out there is incredible, phenomenal, and fantastic. Thank so, you. Thank you for all you've done for the bodybuilding community so far and are going to do for the bodybuilding community. You're making a great impact. Guys, don't forget to follow Pat on Instagram. His links will be in the bio. Guys, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe on this video. Until next time, guys, the underdog.